Hey everyone, so here at TDR, we like to look at three things when it comes to the long-term growth and success of a psychedelic company. One, are they cashed up? Two, do they have the proper research diversification? And three, do they have the roadmap to scale their business that meets the requirement of financial institutions? Well, this company in our latest podcast meets all three components. Who are they? Find out now. Hey everyone, welcome to the Dales Report podcast. I am happy to be joined once again, Peyton Nyquist, CEO of Numinous Wellness, which trades on the TSX under the ticker symbol NUMI. Peyton, it's been a couple of weeks, maybe actually a month or two since we last spoke. How are you? I'm doing well. I'm doing well. How are you doing? I'm trying to get by. You know, I will say it's uh, crazy times to say the least, but uh, you got to actually appreciate more and more about what you're doing in the industry that you're doing, knowing that, and I know we've had discussions in the past, but I'm really starting to see as far as the society right now, um, we're starting to see the true aftermath of this, this global pandemic that has occurred over the past couple of years. Uh, do you find that? And are you seeing a lot of like day-to-day -day work, the, uh, the importance and emergence of your company, your industry more and more? Yeah, absolutely. And, you know, it, it's, it's unfortunate that we, we have to talk about the sort of size of the, the opportunity, but yeah. uh, people, the, people are struggling. And, and I think in a period now where we're trying to reclaim back some level of, of normalcy and, right. and get back to, to work, get back into community and people are challenged and, mm -hmm. Um, you know, at a time, frankly, where we've recognized also that a lot of the ways we've tried to treat mental health have, have not been effective for people. Um, you know, the, the other side of that is, is in our space, you're continuing to see a huge amount of support and change, you know, almost weekly, you see another state that is, is bringing psychedelics onto a, a bill to, to try and change regulatory reform, obviously what's happening in Canada right now. Um, How about it, the state it, of Utah? You know, when you think about, you know, a lot of their house, which is actually represented majority wise by Republicans. Yeah. And there's a bill that's going to the governor uh, in the next, I think, week or two. Um, that's a pretty telling sign when you think, and I know, I think it's been overlooked a lot, but even a state like Utah is yeah. moving along too, right? Yeah, well, exactly. And, and I think important for the for the US is, you know, this sits on both sides of the aisle, right? You, mm -hmm. you see everybody moving to to support whether that's decriminalization, you know, now Oregon most recently has come out with with some of their thoughts around what the the legal psilocybin access is going to look like. So, you know, we're at a, a very, very interesting time in the space at the moment. And again, at a time where um, needed more now than ever before. You know, we, we obviously keep a very, very close eye on the sort of mental health stats and post COVID it, it's, um, it's time for it's sure. Opener. It is, it, it is. And, uh, so we're grateful to be able to, to be doing our part. That's good. Well, when we talk about your part, I want to begin with your research. You're about to embark on two clinical trials that are set to launch. The first one being your phase one proprietary uh, psilocybin extract, otherwise known as NBIO-01, and the second Canadian sites of the MAPS Phase 3 study of MDA for PTSD, which obviously has garnered a lot of tension. So in a nutshell, how does it feel to be at this moment and finally get your first organic study of uh, psilocybin into clinical trial? Because this is big. Yeah, I, I think, you know, on the psilocybin side of things, it's it's super exciting for us. Um, and again, you know, I mentioned Oregon, which if you if you look at those regulations, legal, uh, natural psilocybin, they, they've clearly spelled out that they're not looking for they're not only they're not looking for, it, but they're not going to be approving synthetic psilocybin wow. as it stands right now. So there's a really a very very strong interest in natural psilocybin. We've already seen natural psilocybin being used in Canada for the Section 56 exemptions. Yep. You know we see potential for Health Canada to move towards approving just natural psilocybin use. Uh, there's there's strong efforts on the 
special access programs. So um, to be able to develop, you know, a, a natural psilocybin product is is really really exciting. And again, yeah. for us, with the focus of accessibility, um, it may be the first accessible form of psilocybin that's used on a on a more broad set broad scale. So it's exciting, and uh, to be able to start to get that into clinical implementation is oh. uh, is a big one. If I'm new to the space and I'm learning, what do you think is the biggest difference between natural and say synthetic and why most importantly, is that an important thing? Yeah, that's a great question. So natural psilocybin or psilocin is, is, is um, something that occurs within psilocybin containing fungi. Yeah. And, you know, mother nature has been, been developing that product for a very long time. And one of the things that we see within natural psilocybin containing fungi is there's other compounds that potentially have therapeutic benefit that exist yep. within that fungi. Well-known compounds like melatonin, serotonin, and, and baocysteine, all the way to previously undiscovered compounds potentially that have therapeutic benefit. So we see an opportunity there. Obviously, from a, a public perception standpoint, most people who are turning to psychedelic-assisted therapy have probably tried some form of synthetic um, medication and are looking for a more natural route. So huh. that's that's where we you see believe that. What's that? You believe that? I think so. I do. Um, I, I think most people, you know, big pharma at, at times yeah. is sort of a four letter word for people. And, and I think people want to know, you know, where their products coming from. Is it naturally sourced? Um, and so I do think if, if all things, you know, say we're in a, an environment where psilocybin is generic, and you've got a generic synthetically produced psilocybin or a naturally sourced psil psilocybin product, both you know meet all of the standardization and requirements needed for the FDA and Health Canada. I think people will probably be more oriented towards towards a natural product. Um, yeah, I was going to say like when you look at the uh, the state of Oregon. Uh, they're really leading probably most states across the US and if they yeah. are leaning towards the natural derived route. Could you see this, I guess, as a trend across the country? And because um, there are a lot of companies that are looking at synthetic in the U.S. right now. But uh, translate that. But how does that all come to fruition, I guess, as we get further down this road? Yeah, you know, I, I think it's really interesting what's happening in Oregon at the moment. Um, there's there's a really strong effort around just uh, accessible supply and not creating a, a monopoly or, or something like that in regards to synthetic psilocybin. Um, I think you could see other states potentially get on board as well. Um, obviously, the decriminalization movement you've seen in the U.S. Um, supports that. Yeah. I think... I don't, I don't think we maybe get to a place where it's one or the other or, or either or. I, I, I think we probably get to a market where you can choose. And obviously, the, the big thing that comes into question is, is probably around insurance coverage. Mm -hmm. And what are insurance providers going to potentially be um, comfortable with covering? And so for us to be able to do a clinical trial with a natural compound gives us the data that we need to be able to go to insurance providers to, to get insurance coverage with while producing a natural product. So we're, we're sort of on both sides of it, which, which has been, you know, sort of our intention from the very beginning. What I like about the industry, it's not one or the other, as you said, yeah. a lot of people are trying to support and that's just the times that we're in right now. Right. Yeah, yeah exactly. Exactly. I want to um, circle back to go ahead, go ahead. I, I, I was just going to say, and then touching obviously on the MDMA for, for PTSD work that we're doing. Um, and I feel like I'm, I'm probably a broken record on here talking about the, the MAPS results. But just to reiterate, um, their phase 3A, over 80% of participants saw significant clinical reduction in their symptoms with MDMA for treatment-resistant post-traumatic stress disorder. And 67% no longer met the PTSD criteria. Um, so essentially a cure for PTSD. And again, with people with treatment resistant PTSD. So these are people that have tried other treatments and they haven't worked. So for us to, to help continue to, to expand upon that work, MDMA uh, and MAPS anticipates being complete their clinical trials and having MDMA legal for therapy towards the end of 2023. Um, obviously in Canada, we have the special access program. There's, there's some, 
um, doors that are starting to open with with more accessible routes of MDMA for for post traumatic stress disorder. So to be really at the forefront of uh, of this um, coming to market is really really exciting for us. Um, and and obviously being able to implement it in clinic and and train you know the workforce to be able to yeah. do MDMA assisted therapy is awesome. That story never gets old when you and I talk about it all the time. Sixty seven percent cured. It's really- Sounding. Yeah. You know, that is one word that I think a lot of scientists like to steer away from. Um, but again, that was a st- How long ago was that now? Is it six months ago now? Yeah. Yeah. Just about. Yeah. So if I'm watching this, I'm an investor or an analyst. Uh, explain, like, how does this, like, this is MAP study. So how does this exactly benefit your company? Mm-hmm. And regardless of the results, knowing that uh, you're hosting the study. So ultimately for us, if you think about things like clinical implementation, starting to get it into a real world setting, um, MDMA is going to need to flow through um, networks of therapists who are able to administer the therapy. And MAPS is going to be the provider of the drug product and training. So MAPS, obviously, especially in the early goings, it's going to be crucial for MAPS to be able to Um, sell drug and distribute drug to companies or to practitioners that have the training that are familiar with the product who can start to get it into market in the most low risk way possible. So for us to be working with maps for as long as we have and continuing Mm -hmm. going forward, we, we sort of set ourselves up as sort of the provider of choice um, in with maps, you know, there'll be some others as well, but it gets us very familiar with the protocol, with the therapy, um, and, and setting up sort of all of the necessary distribution channels, which obviously with our licensing out of our laboratory, we can be a drug product distributor as well. So, um, gets us, gets us very familiar with it, gets us as a a very easy, um, first choice for maps when, when, um, therapy is approved and starting to set up that nef- necessary infrastructure um, in Canada. And, and now as we as we look to expand into the U.S., um, south of the border as well. When I look at, and this is a lot of like institutions that I've spoken with, is you need to be cashed up, you have to have diversification, but most importantly, you have to explain your roadmap getting from point A to point B. I assume that you're having a lot of those same conversations and this has to be this study that you're focusing on the forefront based on your conversations with them, is it not? It is. The 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 two studies that we both mentioned are, are sort of are very big ones for us. Um, you know, you you mentioned being cashed up. Obviously, we we have the good fortune of of having over fifty million dollars in the bank at the moment, generating revenue and and not only that, but we've continued to rely on the, the traditional mental health services that we administer as well. So yep. um, companies in a great spot this year is extremely, extremely exciting for us. Um, obviously the space in general has, has been under an immense pressure um, from the capital markets lately. Um, but, uh, but I think if you look towards the future and as we've talked about continued regulatory um, support and changes, really necessary research continuing to be underway yeah, and and unfortunately, a market that continues to grow daily. So um, I, some I, things I, are already control. But if you guys were all private in this sector, it'd be Mardi Gras. Like when you think of everything that's developed from where we were, and I know one other thing you always bring up is let's manage ex- expectations and think about where we were twelve, eighteen months ago. Like mm-hmm. we had an election back in November mm-hmm. of twenty twenty, and mm-hmm. it was like groundbreaking news to see the state of Oregon decriminalize and that. Look at all the other areas across the U.S. where there's bills that are going to governor's desks and they're starting to review, not only review, but approve a lot of this stuff, which, again, is carrying the conversation, right? Exactly. And I, and I think one of the things that gets missed a lot of the time as well is if, if you look at the, the way that Big Pharma, for example, usually introduces a new drug into the healthcare system, mm-hmm. right? They, they do clinical trials. They, they establish a product and then it's, it's usually about a 10 year education process to get the market educated, to get physicians educated, to get it, to, to get that product launched. Is right? it that long? Wow. It's, it, it, it's usually about that long. If you look at this space, there's a huge <laughs> amount of education already. Yeah. There's, there's a <clears throat> thriving underground market for psychedelics at the moment. 
And to the point where we've got people lobbying for decriminalization, we've got yeah. all of the effort underway. So, you know, there's this anticipated demand that is continuing to grow and grow and grow. So, you know, I think the, the second you see approvals happen, I think you're going to see an explosion of, of interest and support for the space. Um, and I think you've seen some really exciting examples of that on sort of the payer side lately. You know, even most recently, Dr. Bronner's, um, which is a, a one of the larger um, growing companies in the U.S. at the moment, has seen a huge amount of acclaim for the way they run their business, just recently announced that they're providing um, financial support for their employees looking to do ketamine-assisted psychotherapy. Wow. So you're starting to see companies continue to provide financial support for this work as well um, due to the effectiveness and frankly due to um, being able to in a shorter period of time hopefully get their employees back to happier and healthier lives there's a special place in hell for people shorting this industry <laughs> that's the way i look at it it's just like some things just aren't meant to be all about money when i look at this industry it's innovation i i Love what Kathy Wood and her position now, and she increases her share. She's invested in a tie, and it's a separate company. But key players in this space that are doing the proper research in the robot, like yourselves, um, we've, we've re reached a roadblock, you know, when it comes to pharma. And uh, innovation, obviously, is what people are really starting to notice, obviously, uh, with this industry. Um, we've talked a lot about the U.S. Last month, uh, as we've discussed before, it was welcome news for many in the industry. Uh, especially numinous uh, pertaining to the SAP being amended. And uh, one thing to highlight, too, is that your company was named as one of Health Canada's approved suppliers of psilocybin for the SAP-approved therapy. So explain to my viewers as to why you believe you were selected. You know, we've been working with Health Canada for over 10 years now out of the lab. And, you know, for the special access program in particular, we we – um, uh, our, our group and, and some others were part of uh, the collection of people that put together a briefing note to actually change the special access program. So we've, we've been working with Health Canada and, and in particular around the special access program for quite a long time. And if you look at our capabilities out of the lab, um, we're not just a licensed facility trying to figure it out. We, we can manufacture, we can distribute, we, we know these compounds extremely, extremely well. And if you look at what Health Canada is looking to approve in regards to the special access program, differently than the Section 56 exemptions, which people have seen, the special access program needs to sort of mirror or look at other clinical research that's happened uh -huh. and then approve those protocols. So right. we have great phase two data um, for psilocybin for a number of different indications. And so to try and, and meet those requirements and standards of Health Canada, in a more broad spread accessible model than just the sort of one-offs that we saw in the Section 56 program. Do you see uh, revenue being generated based on the amendment for yourself uh, relatively soon? Absolutely. Yeah. yeah. Absolutely. Mm -hmm. Last thing I want to touch on, I know we talked about back in December where we mentioned that you believe the sector will indeed uh, enter a phase of consolidation. So saying that, um, what are you seeing? Um, and I, at the same time, are you seeing a lot of potentially maybe reasonably priced assets that could uh, obviously expand your company. Yeah, I, I, I think we've been in that consolidation phase and I think we're definitely in the thick of it at the moment, um, which, which I think has been necessary. Um, there's, there's definitely some interesting assets that are out there. Um, you know, again, we're, we're sort of in a, in the fortunate position from a cash perspective uh, and a revenue perspective to, um, be able to to take a look at a number of potential opportunities out there, um, but really not deviating from our plan in terms of of making sure that there's good reoccurring revenue and it continues to drive towards the mission that we've set out to uh, to achieve. So there's there's lots of opportunity out there. I think you've seen the the investor get really educated in terms of where is value going to be created in mm -hmm. the space. And I think to to really, you know, the, the simplest form of that, especially in the sort of short to medium term, is, is it is going to be service-based businesses that are now being able to provide the therapy, which is really, you know, again, right around right. the corner and, and not only right around the corner, but sort of here already with the special access program and now some of these changes on a state-by-state -state level. So I think that's really where 
where you need to continue to look yeah. is where's revenue and value being created. Yeah. Yes, drug development and drug innovation is is important, but but is also a, you know it's a long term game and uh, yeah. and it's it's needed, but <clears throat> but it's going to take some time. So the vision is to continue then to expand your assisted therapy clinic footprint. Yes, absolutely. So Canada, obviously well positioned. Uh, the trial for MDMA with MAPS, I assume, would be a good rollout plan for a U.S. Uh, uh, footprint as well. Correct? Yeah, and and we are in the process of of uh, looking to to make a significant move into the U.S. Um, mm. and. and you know, with the platform we've created in Canada, um, everything that we built has been with the intention of being able to expand into the U.S. as well. So, um, understanding Is that a big the attention and focus for you here in 2022. Yeah, absolutely. Yeah. Okay, absolutely. Yeah. Well, listen, I appreciate the update. I know you're busy. Stay well, keep well. Um, but yeah, love the story. Love what you guys are doing, and uh, most importantly. Um, manage expectations and believe in innovation, which you, which you guys are doing. So again, I appreciate the update. Let's keep in touch. Sounds great. Good All right. Thanks, Peyton. You.